Jason Williamson, Andrew Fern, welcome. Sleaford Mods, of course. Um, I want to yeah. start really about your backgrounds and the families that you were brought up in and whether there was any cultural atmosphere where you could really envisage having a cultural output later in life. Um, I didn't really think about it. <clears throat> was never politically conscious. Was never, um, was never conscious of poetry. Was never conscious of, well, 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 you know, not a lot. You know what I mean? Right up until the last minute, I suppose. Um, mm. I, don't, I don't know. You know, once you vote, once you learn how to vocalise things, <laughs> uh, once you, you know, you know, a lot of people don't connect themselves to uh, the matters in hand. Uh, you know, life, society, the the, the constraints of uh, the constraints of all that. But if you do. Uh, and you come from a background that is very much embedded in work, um, and, and very much embedded in working class culture. Then, then uh, you do marry the two together. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I completely understand that. I just come to Andrew though, because the, the background that I was brought up with, my father was a market trader, my mother uh, was a nurse, and so yeah. they both would say to me, "You know, you've got to get something." <laughs> Where you where you earn money? Yeah, I think quite across the board. You know, lots of people. I, mean, I remember at school <clears throat> having friends whose parents educated them at home. You know, they had like a parent who was a a teacher or or just educated them at home. You know, and they definitely had an advantage. And I, I think, you know, like Jason was saying, not knowing about poetry. I mean, I knew about things like that, but it didn't really make any sense to me. You know, I didn't really know. I, th I didn't really grasp it. It wasn't until I left school that I started to educate myself that I really understood yeah. what what English literature and the English lang language actually meant. You know, I, I think if you've only got, I mean, without you particularly gifted anyway, but, you know, most kids growing up in the 80s that didn't have academic parents, my dad was, my dad's quite dyslexic. You know, he's, he's a, you know, he's a plant hire plant hire business that he's been successful at but he's basically used his hands and worked hard to yeah. achieve money you know and you don't um you know you don't uh what am I trying to say it's it's you just don't understand what what's education you know you don't have that uh connection with it until you make that connection yourself school never gave yeah. that connection with English literature we had terrible teachers for English at school Oh god, yeah. Mm. yeah. And same so for what, history. I said the same about history. It wasn't until I left school that I thought, oh, history's actually quite interesting. <laughs> well, they're, they're just teaching the same old shit, don't they? You know. It's yeah. like it's not it's yeah. not really proper history, it's just their account of a nice gentrified English history, isn't it? You know. And they just seemed like they didn't enjoy teaching it either. You know. No. So what music were you brought up around, Andrew? What what did your parents play at home? Um, well, my mum was quite into music generally, you know, but just the obvious sort of commercial end of the Beatles, Elvis, a lot of rock and roll stuff, you know. Um, but then as, as I grow up, I used to see albums on TV like Kato albums and compilations, even when I was really young and I'd just stick them in my mum's trolley when we go to Asda. And she would, she would kind of want the record as well, you know. Um, and that that was it, really. There wasn't really any, any particular um, family member that was really into music. Um, what about yeah. you, Jason? Um, just um, <clears throat> just uh, like TV, really. Top of the Pops. When I was a kid, like nine, eight or nine. And... Yeah. The kind of records your dad played, mm. um, and just like looking at pop stars on Saturday morning kids programs as well, uh, and then um, up, don't you? yeah, you just pick it up, and then around ten uh, ten years of age, probably got into you know um, punk, Sex Pistols, and stuff. Was introduced to that with by my stepbrother's vast record collection of punk and new wave punk. By then it was new wave. There was a second wave of punk with 
the exploited GBH, all that business. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I've got, I got in, interested that way. But again, didn't really connect that with anything social, social political. Do you know what I mean? Just too young, you know. And I think you don't really, really start looking at it until you start suffering, which is usually from around twenty-one. <laughs> you know, when you when you thrust into well, I, at sixteen, seventeen, I, I went to work, so it was like a wake-up call. But I, I, I consider that to be like earning my common sense stripes, you know, being able to do practical work fast under a lot of pressure and working with a bunch of fucking savages, basically, you know. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it, you know, it, it took a while. No, nobody gives a fuck about politics down there, do they? Down the lower ebbs of society. You know, not a lot of people do, which is why they are thrown around so much, so much by those at the top. You know, the nineties was people were just drunk, stone. Yeah, yeah, that was again. It was. You know, I used was, to know a bunch of people that lived at Nine Lady Stone Circle, which is a, it's, it's in Derbyshire, on a bus. You know, and like there was one guy that used to wear a dress, and just they just taking mushrooms up there every day. They just lived up there for like four months. You know, and we go and visit, shit. and um, you know that's kind of the sort of thing that you would. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I used to know pitch shift. I used to go around to their house and sit in their room while they were jamming, and they're just a bunch of crusty stoners. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Different yeah, world. You had it. You had it. You had it good around there. I think I should have done that rather than hang around <laughs> pretentious clothes shops doing right. cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> um, your parents separated when you were very young, Jason. How did that yeah. make you feel? I was just like gutted. It was horrible. You don't want that. <clears throat> you know, splitting up, that's not right. And I think that's affected me throughout. I think my relationship with other people, with women, initially was kind of, um, I didn't like splitting up. Or I, I got clingy because I wanted, I didn't, I didn't want to feel like that again because it was like, it was like, bro it was like a break, a broken heart. Even though like your parents aren't perfect and uh, you don't, but you, you just don't want them to go away to, you know, mm. you've been brought up with these two adults and therefore, regardless of their limitations or whatever, um, you want to, you want them to stay together. Yeah. So it's quite violent, divorces, I think. It has to be handled well. And I think my parents probably didn't handle it very well because they were very young. I think you can separate and you can handle it very well, but you've got to... You've got to really, really include the kids, but in a, an intelligent way. And also, you can't be arguing in front of them, you know, and stuff like that. I think there are ways for children to understand that sometimes adults just don't get on. You know what I mean? The reason I ask um, that, though, is because my my parents split up and I found out yeah. later that my father, when my mother had a third child or got pregnant with a third child, yeah. which was me, my father already wanted to leave her and didn't have anything to do with me and I feel right. that my you know I've eventually became <clears> a presenter <throat> on MTV and now I'm a writer and that yeah. my drive came from this perceived lack of love from my father and I just wondered because I've done a lot of research into sort of a lot of uh very famous singers mm -hmm. and a lot of them have a wound in the childhood which seems to relate to them getting their drive and being successful oh, I, to I totally i totally think that it's connected to that without a doubt without a shadow of a doubt i yeah. totally think that my need for attention comes from that without a doubt you know yeah. uh you know you can't I, I wouldn't deny that absolutely not um but um i guess there's worse things to fall into isn't there <laughs> it's like, you know it's um you deal with your traumas don't you we all do um, yeah. and some people don't they, they just linger with people and you know some people don't know how to deal with them and I don't think there's anything wrong with that but it's like um, I think uh, yes possibly the quest for um, you know the motivation as you as you said Steve um, I agree you know it's, it's I think that was powered by that definitely Andrew, how about you? I don't know what your family background is or, or where do you feel <laughs> that your drive may have come from. 
Well, I was going to say, you know, my my um, my parents didn't get divorced, but a lot of friends around me, most of my friends' parents got divorced. And particularly one family in my village who were close friends, um, you know, it kind of worked out really well for them. You know, when they when their mum uh, met someone else, their kids got on really well with them and it just made their family bigger. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> and my family were very much, they were out every weekend just getting shit-faced. You know, and um, I was very much home alone quite a lot, you know, um, from like 11. Um, So I guess, yeah, maybe it comes from that. You know, I always felt like, because I've got a brother that's five years older than me. So once I was, uh, you know, 10 or 11, he was was out. You know, he was never at home. So, um, yeah, you know, I don't know. know. It's all relative, isn't it, to your own experience, you know. People think mm. my parents weren't rich, but they were. My dad was doing all right for himself, better than a lot of people in the village. Um, so yeah, you know, it's uh, definitely spent a lot, too much time on my own, probably from mm. that age, you know. And I was already like, you know, wanting. I bought. I, I remember buying a keyboard get, get for Christmas. You know, wanting this little keyboard, um, and just recording things with crappy tape decks and. You know, just wanting to make music, really. Yeah. I mean, you're going to deride my taste probably here, Jason, but <laughs> when I was a teenager, which was, I was 13 in 72, so I'm a generation older, um, Bowie was a big hero um, mm-hmm. at that period, but it wasn't just his music. He provided a world where I wanted to sort of go into from my parents' world, and particularly mm-hmm. as sort of a a young gay teenager, for me, he represented some sort of sexual freedom apart from everything else in the the music. Um, And and the 70s was a really sort of nasty era of, you know, anything that could, any homophobia, sexism, racism, misogyny, the whole Mm. bloody works. The 70s was packed with it more than any other Mm. decade, I think. But is there a musician that really sort of, showed you a world through their music that you wanted to <clears throat> enter? Um, well, I don't know. I didn't, I don't know if I wanted to enter their world. I mean, I was heavily influenced by um, the Sex Pistols initially, but um, uh, it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't kind of, I don't know if um, being in, wanting to be in their world was uh, the right thing. I don't know. I just, I found escapism with it. I found escapism with the jam, but again, Paul Weller, it looks to be a very um, regular bloke like anyone, you know what I mean? So I don't know if there's any, if, if there's much there to escape into. He's a, he's a very kitchen sink type songwriter. Um, uh, you know, very English, very miserable, uh, but not, you know, um, so yeah. it's, I, there's nothing much to escape into there, but I think it was more identifying with these people. I, I identified with Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols and Paul Weller uh, because they reminded me so much of everyone in my environment, you know. Uh, and although the Pistols were a, a working class band thoroughly, I, I kind of identified more with Steve Jones and Paul Cook because they seemed... They look. They just look like every other person that I knew. Do you know what I mean? Um, and Paul Weller as well, to a certain degree. Uh, so I think it was identification, really. There wasn't any escapism. Um, just probably escapism in the idea of mod or the idea of uh, fame. Uh, you know, but I didn't really equate that with music too much. It was more film that I equated the idea of fame with. Okay, Andrew, what about you? Was it were there soundscapes that musicians made that sort of provided sort of yeah. a? <clears throat> I mean, I was going to say, you know, same before, you know, I didn't really mention, you know, because I'm gay as well, but I, I didn't really, I don't think that really affected me in a, um, you know, in my ambitions, if you like, you know, but um, I think uh, sort of like 14, 15, I was crazy about the Pet Shop Boys, like the first two albums. And just completely the production of the music. So it's probably whoever, you know, Trevor Horn or whoever produced the the stuff, Stephen Haig and people like that. Um, then then 
really, you know, because it was headphone music that I would escape into a world of, uh, that they create, which was a kind of a looking, you know, looking at it now, it's not a really very, it's a very sort of image based world, isn't it? You know, like, um, you know, the album covers and, and stuff that they, the set yeah. you know, the, yeah. the images, it's very sort of, um, <clears throat> you know, um, even though I wasn't, I didn't pick up on the fashion element of it. It was just that escapist world, you know, you know, the, the whole things about escaping, you know, and also the fact that I knew they were gay and they didn't come across like other flamboyant pop stars did in the eighties, you know, even though people knew that they were gay, it didn't, they didn't look gay, you know, which I guess I kind of largely related to, you know, I was one of those yeah. gay kids at school. I didn't, I wasn't on the radar. People didn't know I was gay. Whereas there was other kids at school that were, that couldn't hide it, you know. Um, and I just watched this kind of like teen film yesterday called Love, si Love Simon, which deal dealt with it really well because he's exactly like that. And he starts chatting with a guy online and then he, in the, he, He's uh, in the library and he leaves the, the computer open and someone else finds it, so he starts blackmailing him. And he feels like he's losing control of his, of his identity because um, he can't choose when, when to come out, you know. Um, mm. So I kind of related to that quite a lot because you, you, you did, it's not a big deal that you're gay, but even in the 80s, but it for some reason it's something that you have to deal with at the same time, mm. you know. Mm. And it kind of gets hyped up. So I think when I left school, I basically just went, you know, I was specifically just pent up because I couldn't express myself at home. Sure. And just, just went mental and took loads of drugs and, you know. Yeah, I didn't really see a future for myself. You know, I didn't really, yeah. um, you know, I couldn't be turning 16 and the... Uh, the the age of consent had been lowered to 16 when I turned 16 but at the same time they banned uh, any sexual uh, imagery from television from the BBC so it was a double-edged thing going on there which was very confusing at the time do you know what I mean and I just felt really you know it made you feel excluded from gay culture really you know like you didn't really feel part of it and yeah you know I'm sure there's a lot of people that can relate to that you know because you're a little bit older aren't you than me i'm born in 1959 so i think i'm pretty okay. much a lot older. well i mean you know if you if you're sort of part of the if you're over 50 i'm 51 so if you kind of like dipped into the 70s more more and you had bowie you kind of had a different kind of world world or a different um experience but for me it was a completely 80s experience which was uh i don't know, do you know what i mean it's quite debauched at the same time do you know what I mean it's like you you either dive in and and uh you know which wasn't really what I was like as a person so it's not you both yeah. mentioned you both mentioned drugs um already and yeah <laughs> because I because I I I had this massive phase as well where I went completely deranged and it was basically over a sort of 10 year period until I lost everything. Um, oh. And I, I I just, you know, and at party drugs. So mine were like yeah. Coke and E and I'd yeah. do what I think, you know, in essence, what you're saying, Andrew, is I would go to clubs and go completely bananas. But it was all about when I look back on it and I don't have a moral perspective to it. But all I have is that it was um, a, an era where I was escaping myself. And I, I was fooled by drugs because I felt they were giving me something until years later where I realised that they weren't fulfilling me or giving me any creativity or giving me anything in my life, essentially, Absolutely. apart from going completely fucking bananas. So yeah. how, how do you, Andrew, first of all, how do you view drugs in that perspective and what they gave you and what they took away from you? Yeah, so my thing was acid. Do you know what I mean? We were all doing acid, which I mean, I think hallucinogenics are a little bit more rewarding, but uh, but you know, initially, because you you have some quite memorable experiences. But it did get to a point where we were doing it every weekend, and it wasn't really doing what it used to do. You know, um, of course, after that, when ecstasy came in, you were doing that as well. But um, 
Yeah, you know, I mean, again, it was, it was. I think the thing about escaping was um, you didn't, you know, as a creative, I didn't make any music. You know, when I lived in Newark, the three or four years I was in Newark uh, after school, I was just getting absolutely wankered all the time. You know, I mean, but since I moved to Nottingham, I bought a four track, borrowed a guitar. So I mean, I started making music instantly, you know, and before that, when I was at home, even if I only had a keyboard to play, you know, I was always like playing it. I was just obsessed with playing, making music, you know. So it created a bit of a, um, you know, what I kind of became, which is very sort of, you know, just sort of double-edged. I could be quite recluse for a while and stay in and just make music. And then I think, well, for my own health, I better go out for a bit. <laughs> How about but, you, Jason? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, cocaine and the same, really. <clears throat> Cocaine and ecstasy, uh, speed at the end. Um, but yeah, I'd lost everything a few times actually. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, fortunately, my mum would always took me back three times and would, um, you know, if I got into trouble with any dealers uh, or just needed money for drugs, I'd get it off my mum. So um, uh, it was. A bit of a weird one, really. Uh, you know, she got into debt for it. But, you know, when I t I've spoken to her recently about it, and she said she did it because she she could, under she could understand why I, I just wanted to forget all the time because life wasn't very good, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, she could understand that, she said. So that's why she, she would do these things. So, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I think it's um, – I regret it. I regret taking so many drugs because I'm so active now. I'm like, I literally, you know, a lot of things, nothing seems like it's a problem. And if there is a problem, then I'll deal with it. You know what I mean? Before I didn't. So, um, you know, I do regret it, I, you know, but at the same time, there is a, a whimsical uh, part of my memory that has, um, you know, some nice thoughts about those times. Um, you can't beat cocaine, it's fucking brilliant, you know. You can't beat alcohol, it's absolutely brilliant. What an invention. <laughs> but, um, you know, you just can't, if you are any which way inclined to <clears throat> not handle it properly, uh, you can't keep doing it, it will destroy you. So, I think uh, it's more about know, escaping though, isn't it? Like if, it actually, is, yeah. if you want to escape and you're happy to escape, whatever you're doing it's great isn't it because it, oh it's, god yeah it's working it's doing what yeah. you want to do but then yes you know if you've got if you've got shit that you want to do you know you can't be stoned all the time you can't i, I think know, you made but, a point that, that's really uh, fascinating because i feel that as a writer that although that era i didn't think was a creative era at the time i feed off that era because so many you know as you said I was you know same I was so wankered <laughs> you know yeah. I had so many mad <laughs> experiences in that period yeah. that I can feed off that yeah. period is that the same absolutely there's two phrases there's one which is um there's a phrase that says make new mistakes um and then someone yeah. said to me I said about I think I was from my 30s I said to a mate about I feel like I've wasted a lot of time and he said lies for wasting you know, like, and you can't have a perfect life, can you? Do you know what I mean? No, like, no, you do? you're not, no, no, you can't. Your life's not, you're not in the military in some no. sense. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you're supposed to do these stupid things in life. And it's the only way that you learn things, you know. It's the reason that academic people that go into a job aren't very good at it because they've got no life experience, you know. Jason, you said that it's powerful not to have money. How impotent is it to have some money? Um, well, you know, it's good. Of course it is. Um, is it powerful? No, I don't think it's powerful. I mean, you don't have to worry so much about buying stuff. But I don't know whether that's a form of power. More, uh, it's, it's more a, um, a privilege, isn't it? Uh, I suppose. Um, yeah, I like, I like having money more than not having it. But, um, but you know, I'm not rich. I mean, I could probably, you no, know, I could probably not work for three years, but then I'd have to go back to work. 
And I know work. I've, I did work for 25 plus years or got longer. So to be able to not work for three years and then have to go back means nothing to me. Absolutely nothing. It, I may as well go back to work next week. So, so um, you know, I don't consider myself to be, we're not rich. Of course we're not. We're not millionaires. Do you know what I mean? That's rich, isn't it? I would say yeah. that, or is, is having half a million quid rich? Um, I don't know. To some people it probably is, those that haven't got it. But the idea of rich is not to worry about it forever, isn't it? So, um, I think the idea of rich yeah. is doing what you want to do, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. well, no, because rich means to me having money in the bank. That's rich. Right. I mean, kind of richness in like <clears throat> variety and outlook and perception. I would say that that was more a bourgeoisie notion, isn't it? So you just don't you, you don't think like that when you are at the lower ebbs of society. You know, the kind it's almost like a wellness sentiment, isn't it? You know what I mean? You know, nobody's got time for that shit <laughs> if you if you haven't got if you haven't got a lifestyle to match it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm trying to remember the thing that Bob Marley was asked that on a sort of thing recently. I can't remember exactly what he said, but you know, he he basically responded by saying that he's not money's not what makes you rich, you know. But I imagine yeah. Bob Marley, it's a different, you know, the world that he created for himself. Do you know what I mean? Money wasn't money no. didn't make him rich, but you know, when when you're sort of a relatively lower lower middle class and living you know i'm renting at the moment you know what i mean i've got to pay my rent <laughs> yeah i'm not living that kind of lifestyle you know um but you know some people don't need money and they don't care if they lose all their money and they'll still be happy so i don't think i would be when you create something, you're often like when I write, I'm often going through the themes of my life in, in what I'm writing. So I'm I'm constantly sort of regurgitating these themes that have been important in my life and in some way moving on from those themes. Um, yeah. But what works in my writing are still those themes. So for you, Jason, how um, much of a change have you seen in yourself from your lyric writing into you know your sort of perceptions of the world and the perceptions of who you are. <clears throat> um, since when? Since it started? Yeah. Um, well, there's been a change. Yeah. Um, um, <clears throat> it's been a gradual change, um, but it has been there. It's shifted completely. Um, the political things are still there, but now they're more uh, better articulated, perhaps, uh, to a certain degree, or more in keeping with my current position. You know, I'm no longer working in a, uh, an office or a, a warehouse or whatever, you know. I'm a successful musician. So, um, yeah, they're, um, they've changed and matured and become, I think, a bit more intelligent, perhaps. Do you know what I mean? Uh, mm. Totally. And and how is it for you? Because Andrew, because um, you know, I've got a uh, I've got a friend who's a, she's a DJ in Norway, and she she maintains uh, that also it, the just uh, creating the music um, has a massive therapeutic value on her life. So I just wonder whether there's a similarity because I your experience I, I I'm detached from in that sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean. I wouldn't, if I wasn't successful with Sleep of Minds, I'd still be making music, you know, I was making music before and probably on Bandcamp for not many, no one to listen to, like like a lot of uh, people out there that um, haven't been discovered or, or whatever, you know. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a, something that I, that's a therapy, you know, that I do on a daily yeah. basis, you know, always thinking away at something. So, so if the inspiration for the lyrics is the state of Britain Brit and British politics, how does that feed into the inspiration for the music? Uh, well, music's a different uh, thing, isn't it? I think music's, um, 
you know, it, it's a relationship that you have with uh, how you understand music, you know, and mm. you are in some ways a vessel for stuff that's out there in the ether to be uh, created, but you've got to listen in to, to make it, you know, you've got to tune in, as they say, you know, to, uh, and we've slowly created the Sleaford sound as, you know, since I've started it. So, you know, it's just a, it's a subtle thing, you know, of paying attention a little bit, but not too much and relaxing into it. And, yeah. Uh, and just, and just enjoy making music. Cause that's what, that's what I always did when I was unemployed, I had no money. That was something that I always felt couldn't be taken away from me. You know, that's what got me through days of having no money. Cause I already had some gear, you know, I had a laptop to make music with. So I'd be like, right, well, I'm not going to be bored. I don't need <clears throat> television. I can just make music at home, you know. <clears throat> so Jason, how do you see the creative process between you when you come together and make music? And how do you see the division of roles? I mean, obviously there is a division of roles, but is it is it completely distinct or can you sort of cross over in, into each other's area? Um, sometimes I... Certainly sort of, we can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, certainly. It's not I can't I can't engineer and you know I can't um you know uh physically um record any production ideas. So mine's just communication really, if 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 the roles do you know, Andrew Andrew can blurt out a melody and I I get the gist straight away. And I'll, you know, if I've got an idea for, you know, sort of production then i'll just I, you know i tell him vocally and that, that that's as far as that goes you know um most of the time ideally it, it, you know it's it's the music's done we don't really need to do much to it andrew might do something there might be an odd suggestion from me but not uh you know it's not too in depth you know what i mean yeah and there's the occasional time that you know, Jason will be writing a second or third verse for a track and I'll be stuck on something that, again, we will communicate through, you know. And then it might not be the thing that I say, but the thing that I say might inspire him to... Yes, yeah. ...think of something yeah. else. So there was a bit of conversation involved there sometimes. But, yeah, again, you know, that's the great thing about it. They come in different forms, the tracks. You know, uh -huh. sometimes they're just completely there which feels like you have been a vessel to sort of create it. And other times you have to sort of squeeze it out a bit more, you know? Yeah. So what about when you work with other people like Billy No Mates or on, on, the, uh, on the UK Grimm album, Florence Shaw? Um, how, how does that work when they come in? What, what's that, that collaborative process like? Uh, well, it's the same, isn't it, really? We kind of make the track. Yeah. And then, you know, leave a gap, leave a verse for them to fill. Yeah, and they, yeah. You know, and send them that, and then they know exactly where they need to 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 put to put their vocal. Yeah, it's basically, um, you know, we tell them what there might be an idea where uh, for for Billy No Mates collaboration. You know, I have the melody for the chorus, and then asked her if she wouldn't mind doing that, which she did, and then she added her own verse. You know, um, Florence, she just came in, did her own verse. And then I asked her if she'd accompany me on the chorus a bit. That was it, you know what I mean? We pretty much just tell them to do what they want. You know, there's a couple of pointers, but um, generally it, it's always interesting to see if they, you know, what they come up with by just, just doing whatever. I've lived in Germany for, I think it's now 28 years. So originally British, and I've been here, you know, nearly half my life now. <laughs> and for me, my perception of being British has changed in that time because Britain uh -huh. has completely changed in my perception. Maybe it hasn't, but in my perception, it's really changed over that time. So what is it for both of you to, what does it mean being British? Oh, God. Fucking weight around your ankle, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I I don't. I, you know, I, I suppose every country is the same for its citizens. There are rights, and you feel like it's Grand Dog Day. You know, wherever you are, I guess. 
Uh, and, you know, I, I would imagine corruption is present uh, everywhere, you know, in, in the same kind of way. It, it probably comes out in different ways, you know what I mean? But um, Well, you say that corruption is present, but isn't it, there's, you know, when you're away from Britain, you really see Britain as a class-based society, which is, oh, a, well, okay. in essence, from a feudal oh, that's society. That's interesting. Yeah. You no, know, you see it completely, you start to see it completely differently, or I did. That's, oh, okay. I can only that's say my. So, yeah. and, and a class based society, in a sense, I don't know how you can ever change it. So, I just wondered because, you but, know, no. you, you write so much about British politics and it's yeah. clear the unhappiness with, with how society runs in Britain. But how uh -huh. can it be changed? Um, uh, well, I don't think it can, can it? Um, unless there's some miraculous overall. Uh, but I don't think there will be. Um, the, the, the public are stunted. They are, um, they've been conditioned into not overthrowing things. Uh, it's been like that for centuries, you know. There have been times where it's, it's, it's probably gone the other way, but that's usually been spearheaded by, by somebody at the forefront you know, Cromwell, et cetera, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, even that went pear-shaped. So I, I, I don't think um, the idea of revolution is going to work or the overhaul of a system, because you know, what has got to replace it is another, another system run by human beings, you know. We are a chaotic breed, so chaos will ensure wherever we are. And, um, you know, I'd like to think that the class system will eventually die out another 100 years, 50 years, 100 years, God knows. But um, in its place will still be human governance. And, um, you know, we need to get to a place where we're not using um, distraction methods such as capitalism or fascism. Uh, and we work, try to work on our, our um, Achilles heels which is weakness, uh, uh, hatred, you know, bitterness, whatever, you know. I don't think these things will change overnight. So the class system's here for, for a long time, yeah, I would imagine. Uh, but there's also something about, um, uh, you know, th there's a lot of Stockholm syndrome in, in each of us, you know. Uh, we kind of bizarrely love our captors or we bizarrely, like myself, like moaning about them um, whilst conforming to the rules of society. Yeah, I mean, you know, why don't we just all move to Germany, but, you know, which is a great <laughs> idea, but we just don't seem to do it. No, that would be <laughs> a good idea, weird reason. yeah. I mean, what's fascinating yeah. is, uh, you know, I sort of mentioned to a few people that I was interviewing you uh, today, and Germans, and um, they obviously know your music, and they, but also they um, really understand um, the politics in your music and see it as relating to Germany as well, which really well, that's weird, surprised yeah. me. Yeah, but it, well, it it doesn't really. You know, there's a far right, there's a massive far right presence, and it's growing in your country in Germany, isn't it? So, um, so it doesn't surprise me in some respect. During the early eighties, I would spend you know half my life on things like the Miners March, you know, obviously the gay yeah. marches, uh, the march against the poll tax. Things like that, and there seemed to be a, a wealth of of young people when I was young, young people who were interested in politics in some way. And then by the late eighties, it seemed that music um, had moved away uh, from being really politicized, and that young people had moved away from it. And I remember going back. I don't know when it was twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen, whenever that Brexit. The Brexit marches were so I flew back to to England to go on those marches because I was invested, obviously in in that. Although I lived in another country, so why do you think that, um, or, or or really, what do you think you can achieve through your music and lyrics, politically long term, when it does seem that things ebb and move and people lose interest at some point. Uh, we're not looking to achieve anything with it, just telling people, you know, or not even telling people, just saying. Um, it's not a mandate type thing. Uh, I don't believe that music can shift a whole audience's uh, mindset, but um, 
you know, they, I'm just talking, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just reporting on it lyrically. You know what I mean? That's it. Yeah. Maybe it can. I don't know. Do you know what I mean, I was just thinking about like you know you had little things. I mean, even like the dance music era. You know, it did you know site parties, illegal site parties, and all that sort of thing. That was kind of quite massive. You know, and like mm. they quashed that by taking the figure figureheads and and giving them shows on 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 BBC radio. You yeah. know, um, yeah, so, true. Yeah. You, you know, so. Um, You've got to try, haven't you? I think. Do you know what I mean? And like, we, you know, it's surprising that we've managed to get as far as we have initially. <laughs> we've yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think anything is is worth having a go, isn't it? You know. Um, yeah. You never know, and it's down to in, the individual. Everything's down to the individual mm. to to mm. be a, to be a bit more aware, a bit more. I don't want to say woke because it's a clack, you know. Well, it's right. It's, I mean, you know, it's it's been used as a derogatory term, or or rather, just another deflection. Uh, but but I think woke is the idea, isn't it? It's like it is, isn't it? It's yeah, got, it's got to be. It's got to be that because yeah. if it's not, then what? You, you're just being ignorant, and you're not helping. Things need to change because if they don't, people are, you know, the things that are affecting people that need to change. Uh, yeah. If they're not changed, then these people are still going to be hurt, you know. So you need to you need to change, and boom. I mean, one thing that can be changed is your own um, personal sphere, your own sort of <clears throat> sort of bubble. And yeah. um, when it comes to things like ticket prices, when you look at you know the the big American stars uh, when they go on tour, their ticket prices are just so phenomenally ridiculous. That no <laughs> yeah. regular person, and I don't mean even uh, someone who's really on the on the breadline, but no regular person at all can afford that anymore. Um, yeah. And yeah. so, how much are you aware of that, and and how much do you sort of um, try and make sure that people that can't afford to go to a concert can, in some way, come and see you perform live? Um, <clears throat> we've always tried to keep the price down, haven't we? Yeah, I think I think the price has gone up about five quid, probably ten quid since we started, uh, and I'm I'm including buying fees in with that as well. I think um, you know the handlers' fees or whatever. Um, but yes, our manager and bookers. Uh, always keep the price at a realistic level it helps that we haven't got a massive bat line you know we're not trailing around a band or music or instruments we do have a lighting show um but um only for selected gigs so it's it's easy it's not easy but you know we, we we can afford to keep the tickets at a, a, a reasonable price, you know. Uh, but I understand that some bands can't. But um, yes, I agree. A thousand pounds to to go and see someone is just taking the piss. I think you know, given given the current the way things are and how money is devalued or valued, you know, one hundred and twenty quid to go and see someone at an arena. I think it's reasonable. It's a fucking arena, you know, and. You know, it's not 1998 anymore. You know what I mean? Um, but um, but anything past anything past 200, 250, it's just a bit. I don't know. You know, mm. it it just depends, doesn't it? Because you've got, and I'm not trying to justify it for them, but as you well as you you know, when you see see what these people have to fork out for, I guess lighting shows, catering, support bands. Uh, if they've got a massive booking show, you know, if they want to put on this spectacle of entertainment, I suppose it needs paying for, but it's a tough yeah. one. I think a thousand pounds. Yes, though. exactly. Yeah. It's a thousand pounds just takes a piss for anything though, really. Yeah. It just does, you know. Yeah. And Andrew, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I mean, just the same really, you know, if, it, if it's just four blokes on the stage playing guitars, then <laughs> it's it like, really cost that much money. You know I mean? No, and, you know, kind of like meeting them and paying extra is, yeah, it's just... So what do you, put, just, in your, what do you put in your stage rider that is different to other bands? Don't really have um, anything much, do we? Don't have anything, no. Is it not true uh, that you that you say that it's only vegan food for everyone? And well, no, I'm the vegan, so uh, yeah. But I mean, even so, it's like you know, it's a bit of fruit. I mean, yeah. Sometimes if we're touring a, a lot, you know, you don't get chance to eat. So if, as long as like there's some, you know, vegan stuff, you can put in some bread. <laughs> Like yeah. Hummus or something, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, you know, it's. So I want to ask finally about because people like Bob Dylan, Sting, Bruce Singsteen have sold their music rights for millions. Um, how much do you want for Jolly Fucker? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't think we're the type of band to make a sizable amount off our back catalogue, not just yet anyway, you know what I mean? I don't think it would go, but yeah, I, w I would, I would, you know, I don't know, we'd have to bang heads, but if we got to a point in life where it didn't matter and there was a sizable chunk, why fucking yeah. not? You know? I'm sure but at some yeah. point that might, you know, I mean... I don't know. It's it's weird because I think after last year we've kind of obviously got bigger as a band, but yeah, you don't really. It's hard to really quantify where where you're at, you know, or yes. how big yeah. you are. Uh, and We're I not... guess those sort of things reflect that, you know. Yeah. True. Very true. Who knows? Gonna, people aren't going to be doing uh, cover bands. Aren't going to be doing jolly fucker at weddings and things like that, are they? So no, absolutely not. <laughs> Well, maybe they'll do it at funerals. You never know. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> well, Jason Williamson, Andrew Thurn, thank you very much. Steve thank Bruce. you. Brilliant, thanks. Thank you. Nice to talk to you, Steve. Bye-bye. Okay, see you. Bye. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>